Hi there everybody, welcome back to At Home with Dyslexia Scotland. This week we're going to concentrate on a few numeracy games. Numeracy, you might not sort of co-locate that with dyslexia too regularly, but if you think about maths itself, it's very sequential learning, things are asked to be done in an order, and also we do maths very often at speed as well, which when we're considering processing speeds with dyslexia is often quite tricky as well. So today, as always, the activities I've got on the table for you are their visual, their auditory, and their kinesthetic, bringing all of those senses together to help learning stick. So once again, I've got Amelia here with me to play some games a little later on, and William's behind the camera again. About another 15 minutes, just come on in and have a look at some of the orders we're gonna look at today. In you come. Okay, the first thing we're gonna have a look at is number bonds to 10 as in seven belongs to three makes 10, eight and two make 10. If you think of them as friends, if you say, well, eight and two are friends, they're good friends and they get together and they make 10. It's almost like making a story out of learning your number bonds. And number bonds are really essential for the foundations of any further numeracy that you're going to do further up the chain. So here I've got some multi-sensory activities on the table for you to have a little look at. Now, maths is very much about representation. If you're gonna talk about the number six, well, what does number six look like? What does number six feel like? And that's the majority of all the activities we've got on the table today. So make it come alive. Make that sum on the table come alive by using tactile objects. So the first example we could give you here is a tens frame. Now this tens frame has been made out of wood, but you could just make one out of paper. You could draw one on a piece of paper. And here we've got the representation of the number bonds six and four make 10. And again, you can just change this and rearrange this by color coding the numbers that you're doing. So for example, if I wanted to show the representation of seven and three, I would make the sevens all the same color and then the three in a separate color. So the number bond we're showing here are the number friends seven and three make 10. And because this is movable and tactile, it brings in all the senses to help things stick. If I wanted to do another one, eight and two, I would make all of those eight and leave my two number bond friend in a different color as well. You can also do number bonds with playing cards. So I've got some pairs here for you, seven and three, nine and one, etc. You could then put all those cards together and have a, have a game of snap with them. Or you could do that equally with your Uno cards, exactly the same. So as you're turning them over and you're playing snap, you've got your four, your snap would then be looking for a six or etc. to go on top of that. So for example, if you've got an eight, you would then look for your two and that would be your snap and your number bond snap. Okay, and obviously we wouldn't have one of these sessions without the paper cups. So you could use again a twister if you like here. So I've got six and three, is that right? No, it's not. And I'm gonna twist my cup until I get the correct number bond. Six at four is 10. A further representation you could use is sorting. So I've got here six of the yellow ones, again, color coding, represented by some tiles. You can use anything here, games, toys, Lego pieces. And then my number bond friend to go with this would be four. And again, I've color coded that one in red. And you can keep swapping all of these over, sharing and demonstrating with tactile and visual objects. The auditory element comes in as we're saying the numbers. Six and four together makes 10. So that's number bonds using tactile representation. Moving on to times tables. Now times tables, again, is a whole sequence of numbers. Often these sequences don't make sense. Very difficult to get into the long-term memory without some form of multi-century activity to go with it. So there's a few things here on the table I just wanted to show you today that might be helpful for some children. These multiplication stations were made at home by me and my family. They're made from a simple piece of card uh, with these are printed out the times tables. This is a three times table here. Then what you've got to make the multi-sensory element are the bottle tops that screw and unscrew off and they've simply been glued onto the board. 
So you're then going to take all of these bottle tops off and then take your time putting them back on. What is the number that represents that times table? And it is the act of putting the bottle top back on that makes it tactile and multi-sensory. And then the ordinary tree element is you're going to bring in saying the times table at the same time. And this is again a lot more fun than sitting looking at that times table on the desk. You're going to bring it to life and turn it into some form of game. And there's another one here, you could do them colour coded, um, whatever is easier for you and your children. So they're multiplication stations that can be made at home as well. We often see many children using a multiplication square. Now these can actually be quite confusing for some children, especially if you're thinking about directionality. Which way do I actually go? We've got to go along and up or along and down to find the answer. And this can be quite confusing. So one different way of doing this, and this was given to me by a lovely teacher friend a few weeks ago, is something called a flexi table. Now you can buy these or you can make them. And as you can see, this has been color coded and they're not in the right order. And this is for one particular reason. The first thing you can do is bend it. So all you're gonna be looking at is one times table at a time. So that's really, really helpful to take away all the other times tables to, to get away the anxiety and to cause any confusion. What you're then gonna do is start looking for patterns. Which times tables can I put together? So for example, the one times table and the two times table. The two times table is double the one times table. So you can sit them right next to each other for a comparison and then you can start to play games with doubles. Similarly, you could put two and four next to each other. If I just bend that back a second, put two and four next to each other. Again, to make comparisons, look for patterns and play a doubling game. Likewise with four and eight. You can then do the same using the three and the six and perhaps the five and the 10. But this just gives a lot more flexibility in shrinking down the ones you're looking at, looking for patterns, looking for comparisons. You may have heard of using the nine times table on your hands using your fingers and I'll show you exactly how that works in a second. The best way to do the nine times table if you are going to use hands is to make your own hands. We're making things personalised here so it makes it stick even more than it would normally. So you've drawn around your hands or your children's hands. They're going to do this activity themselves so it becomes personalised. They might want to do a little drawing down here or paint the fingernails, whatever makes them feel much more comfortable. And then you can demonstrate how to do the nine times table on hands using their hands. So I'll give you a quick demonstration of this in case you haven't heard of this before. So here we've got the nine times table on two hands and I've numbered the fingers one to five and six to 10. So what we're gonna do is if we're gonna say, well, what is two times nine? You take the number two finger and you bend it down and you look at what is left. So I've got one finger here and eight fingers here. The fingers on this side become tens. So this is 10 plus the eight fingers left is 18. Okay, we'll do that one more time. If you wanted to ask what three times nine is, you would take the three finger and bend that one down. On this side becomes the tens, so that's 10, 20. There are seven fingers left over here, so it becomes 27. Okay, so as much as that's probably quite a well-known way of doing the nine times table, the added bit here to make it totally multi-sensory and personalized is to get your children to make their own times table hands. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to the symbols themselves. And I really wanted to just point out to you the problem with symbols. If you have a little look at the ones I've got on the table here, I've got an equal sign and a minus sign, times and plus, and I've got a percentage and a divide sign. If you take a close look at these, you can understand why some children get completely confused by the symbology itself. And that's why I think it would be a really great idea to cut, to cut some of these out, make your own, color them, personalize them, and have these in front of you all the time when you're doing any kind of math. So you can relate to the symbol and keep getting used to them and over learning. 
So these two, for example, look so similar. You can understand why children get letters confused sometimes. They could get symbols confused as well. These two are very close, really, really close. In fact, I could just turn that one round and they look exactly the same. And the percentage and the divide sign, again, very, very similar. And likewise, with the symbology comes a lot of language, a lot of different words. So I would perhaps encourage you to do some sort of a mind map if that works for your children. So you could put your symbol in the middle and from that symbol then you could draw some lines off and write all the words you can think of that mean the same as add. You don't have to use a mind map, but something along those lines that you could keep to hand all the time to show you actually what the words all mean. Sometimes word problems are very, very tricky, especially when the different words are used within the problem. So to have this on hand would definitely help. And you could do that for each of the symbols as well. Okay, and another thing we're gonna cover now before we play a few games is place value. And place value is hundreds, tens, units. Which column do the actual numbers go into? And sometimes it's very difficult to get these columns in the right order. So again, I've made a very simple frame here. We're talking scaffolding, framework, anything you can do to make it easier to see, to make the visual come alive, color coded, and, and chunking it into lines. So a blank piece of paper would be very difficult for some children to put the numbers into the right columns. So you could make something out of lollipop sticks if you wanted them again to create something personalized. You would then put hundreds, tens and units on the top. So we're really, really co-locating what each of the columns are. And then you're physically placing the numbers in the columns and you can play any games with this whatsoever. What's missing here, of course, is the symbol. Well, what do you want me to do with these numbers? And that's when you would bring in your symbology that you've already made and you would place it on top of your sum here. What better visual could you have? What better chunking of information and coordinating the columns that you need? For the older children who may have squared papers in their books, They've been asked perhaps to do a sum like this. Again, if they're finding it very difficult to put things into columns, and again, I would use color coding. You could even draw a framework around it. So to put 102 into the correct columns on such tiny squares as this, I would again try and use my colors. So my hundreds might be purple, my tens might be green, and my units might be red. I've then got a 37 to add in there. So I'm gonna do a seven there and I'm gonna do a three. And also what often misses when we're doing addition like this is well, which direction do I need to go in? You could make an arrow or you could simply draw an arrow above the sum that you're doing to show you in which direction you're going to be doing the adding up. So put as many kind of indicators on there as you can, colour code it, draw a scaffold until you get used to doing it this way. OK, so we've covered number bonds to 10, a little bit on symbols, a little bit on times tables. Now let's just have a look at a few games that you could play at home to make this learning again come alive. And the first thing you could do is a couple of dice. So Amelia's going to come in and play some games with me. So just two simple dice. You can play lots and lots of games with these. So I mean, if you want to roll the dice and see what we've got. So she's got a six and a three. So there's loads of things you could do with this. You could put your symbol in the middle and have an adding sum. Six add three. You could do a divide sum with this if you wanted to. Six divided by three. So you're bringing in all the symbols as well. You could do a takeaway. And you could even write the whole sum out by putting your equal sign at the end, just by using two simple dice. If you wanted to do something for the older children, you could roll the dice again. You want to do that one, Amelia? Roll the dice again. And here she's got four. And I might say, OK, Amelia, let's add that number on to 10. 10 add four. 14. Brilliant. Or we might say, let's take that number away from 100. <laughs> Thank you. At the same time, I'm going to be saying to Amelia, 
let's take that away from 100 or let's add that on to 10 or whatever sums you're doing at the time. So just two simple dice, you can play lots and lots of games. We've got here some dominoes. Dominoes are great for just looking at the dots themselves and recognising what numbers are on those dots. What can you see without counting them, getting used to them? Again, we can use this for number bonds to 10, six and four. We can use it for multiplication. I've got three lots of six there, three chunks of six. What is three times six? What is six add six? What is double six? So all of these, can all be done with a simple game of dominoes. If you like playing um, knots and crosses, you could do odds and evens knots and crosses. So, Amelia, do you want to be odds or evens? Are we even? You're going to be evens. Okay, so we're going to play odds and evens knots and crosses, okay? So I would then put an even number in here, then it's Amelia's turn. You put, no, I'm an odd number, aren't I? Sorry, you put an even number in there now, Amelia. Let's see if we can get, see if anyone's going to win this game. Okay, so I'm still doing odds, Amelia's doing evens. Okay, I might be really, really generous here, Amelia. And let her win, obviously. Okay, so Amelia's won an odds and evens game there. But again, you can play this kind of game with anything. You can do tens, multiples of ten, multiples of four, something else in the times table. And again, you can use this framework for any of those kind of activities. And then the UNO cards are um, really good. There's many, many games with UNO that you can play. And these are actually online. You can look up playing games online with UNO. And one really good game for this is the place value. So uh, Amelia are going to take the top three cards here. So it's top three cards for you. And I'll take the next three cards. And what we've actually got here, if we put our cards out on the table, Amelia, what we've actually got here, we've got three numbers each. And what we're going to try and do is make the biggest number possible, okay? So you make your biggest number and I'll make my biggest number. And this is where we're going to do the hundreds, tens and units value. And then we see this is called place value war. Who's won the war, I wonder? Mm. It's okay. And then you're going to make it auditory by saying the numbers together. You might also put a H, a T and a U there as well, just to clarify the columns. So I've got 842 and Amelia's got 641, 51. <laughs> 651, that's right. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm running my finger along to show that we're reading the number from left to right as well. And then we say, well, who's got the biggest number? You. I've got the biggest number. So I managed to win this. You won the other game, 842 against 651. So not only is it place value, we've got bigger versus smaller as well. Who's got the biggest number? Who's got the smallest number? So basically, at the end of all this, games and maths and tactile visual auditory make this learning come alive and they make it stick. And you can do these games with any ages. Board games are fabulous for numeracy, for addition, for any kind of learning numbers. For now, that's it for today in uh, At Home with Dyslexia Scotland. Thank you once again for coming along. It's been a pleasure to see you here and hopefully we'll see you again very soon.